For our purposes, this Gurry case is interesting because of what it says about Article 41 of the Irish Constitution, which is the article that addresses the family and family rights in Irish constitutional law. And it's interesting in particular because we get a Supreme Court judgment with two written judgments from judges that disagree with one another, not on the outcome of the case, but very much, very forthrightly, disagree with one another as to the meaning and implications of Article 41. Now, that's what I'm interested in, and that's what I want to get to as quickly as possible. But I guess to kind of paint a picture for you before getting there, let me give you a sense of the facts. Now, I actually have another video, which is a video from a class that I delivered to this, to first-year undergraduates, which is lengthy enough, 15 minutes, on the facts, if you want to um, check that out, you can. I'll have a link here uh, for that, but I don't think you need to. Uh, here's the facts in overview. The Gari case involves a couple, Mr. and Mrs. Gari. He's an Irish citizen. She's not. She's Nigerian. She had been living in Ireland illegally for a few years, had been the subject of a deportation order, but evaded it. Subsequently, she met and later married. Joseph Gorry, the Irish citizen. On foot of that, she requested of the minister that he would consider revoking the deportation order in light, I guess, of the marriage, the fact of the marriage. He, the minister, had discretion to revoke deportation orders. Uh, the minister considered the matter and rejected it and set out reasoning in a letter sent to the Gorries, and the Gorries then challenged that decision, the decision to not revoke the deportation order by way of judicial review. That's what the Gorry case is. So the Gorries lost the case uh, at High Court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court. Excuse me, the Gorries won the case at High Court, Court of Appeal and Supreme Court levels. That is, the all judges were of the view that the minister had reached the decision that he reached otherwise than in accordance with law or had erred in law, I guess, um, in the manner in which he reached the decision. Let me just clarify what it was about how the minister reached the decision that led to its having been deemed unlawful by all of the judges at all levels. In summary, it was because the minister considered the matter based on Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights and then conflated Article 8 of the ECHR with Article 41 of the Irish Constitution, treated them as one and the same. That was an error. Take a look at the language of Article 8 on the right to a private and family life, of the ECHR that is, compare it to the language of Article 41 you'll see quite a difference. And effectively, what uh, the minister did was say, well, here's Article 8, here's the jurisprudence from the Strasbourg Court as to what it means in these contexts, and there's no obligation uh, on me to revoke the deportation order in the light of that jurisprudence, and therefore I won't revoke the deportation order. Effectively not considering the differences arising from Article 41. So, right, so Article 41 of the Irish Constitution protects the rights of the, the family rights. The family is an institution, let's just say, to this level, whereas ECHR, Article 8, protects, let's just say, to that level. And what the minister did was effectively conflated them. That was the error in law. Now, here is where I think we need to bring our attention to the wording of Article 41 of the Irish Constitution, right? So it's it's a really striking article. It's the article I think that perhaps more than any other than any other is distinctive, right, about the Irish Constitution. It's a, a very clearly a, a influenced by scholastic by natural law thinking, by scholastic natural law thinking, and indeed uh, theologians uh, uh, in Dublin at the time were. Uh, influential in the precise drafting were engaged with and corresponding with De Valera and with um, John Hearn and others as Jared Hogan's historical work I traces. So what does that tell us? It tells us that this family is a 
pretty important, not only a pretty important institution, but a, a moral institution that possesses these rights. Now, okay, it doesn't specify what the rights are, but it possesses rights. And these rights are inalienable. They can't be given away or taken away, imprescriptible. Can't be lost through the passage of time. And are antecedent. They come prior to and superior to all positive law. Now, the judges in question, McKechnie and O'Donnell, disagree in the following way as to the meaning of those words in the context of the case. McKechnie is of the view that Article 41 protects a right of the family to cohabit, to live together, and also protects a right of the family to make a decision with respect to where to live, to make a decision to live in this jurisdiction. So they are, if you like, two um, specific rights, standalone as it were, rights, that McKechnie is very satisfied, flow from the language of Article 41 and are covered by Article 41. O'Donnell disagrees. That is to say, O'Donnell doesn't see that there is necessarily a right to, specifically, a right to cohabit. Nor does he see that there a right to specifically make the decision to live together in this jurisdiction, that those rights flow from the language of Article 41 and are covered by Article 41. Now, here's my sense of things, and I'll just say this to set up the kind of, the real substantive discussion in the next video. I think critical to the disagreement is a kind of a prior disagreement between McKechnie and O'Donnell on how to interpret the natural law language of the article in alien and prescriptive antecedent to all positive law. McKechnie basically says this, look, let's take that language seriously but not literally. Okay, McKechnie says, look, if you were to take the language literally, antecedent and superior to all positive law, the family effectively is just above and beyond the state's control, outside of the state's authority. This family existed prior to the emergence of the state, etc. The state can't touch it. You can't take that literally, he's saying. You know, I mean, you just can't do it. So, George Hogan had said something along similar lines in an earlier judgment, which was endorsed. So had Justice Mary Finley Gagan, and that was endorsed. They were endorsed by McKechnie. He said, look, let's, let's say that, that it means the language the, the, the rights are protected to the highest degree that's possible in a democratic society but let's let's not take it literally o'donnell expressly rejects that thesis he says look we can't imagine that the drafters of the constitution john hearn de valera etc and indeed the people who approved the constitution and the plebiscite had, as it were, their metaphor metaphorical fingers crossed behind the ba their backs when they drafted that language. We can't assume, that is, that they didn't really mean, mean the words, but rather meant words that were a bit softer. In other words, we, the judges, O'Donnell is saying, cannot water down the language of Article 41. He's not so much saying we have to take it literally in some kind of unimpeachable or pure sense, but he's He's saying, we have to give those words their ordinary meaning in context. And I feel that McKechnie's approach gives him more scope to be liberal with what kinds of rights are protected by 41, whereas O'Donnell's approach means that he is inclined to be more cautious or restrictive with what he identifies as flowing from Article 41. That's at the heart of this disagreement. And I think, of course, it's relevant in the context of the case, but more interestingly, it's relevant in the context of Article 41, but also how judges, how Irish judges, do right adjudication. Now, I hope you see that what I'm trying to do here is set up the next video, which is the drilling down video, the more interesting exploration of really the analytical rigour that these judges bring to the interpretation of the rights provisions. But let me just conclude this video by pointing out, for those of you who are like me and want to know what the practical outcome are, was, um, how that disagreement impacted the particular case. Well, uh, basically, 
McKechnie said the starting point for the Minister's consideration should have been not only Article 41 of the Irish Constitution, but the fact that the Gorries enjoyed a constitutional right to cohabit and a constitutional right to make a decision to live in this jurisdiction. And he said, let's not take the notion that these rights are unimpeachable, antecedent superior to our positive law. Let's not take that quite literally. These rights can be outweighed, could be outweighed, might be outweighed in this instance. You know, but that, he says, is the starting point. O'Donnell says, no, that's not the starting point. Article 41 of the Constitution might be the starting point, he says, but there's no right to cohabit flowing from Article 41, nor is there that right to make that decision necessarily. There is the fact of the marriage. There is the fact of the family. There is the fact that the Irish Constitution protects the institution of marriage and protects the institution of the family. Right. So you might say, well, look, <laughs> what's the difference? You're going to get to the same conclusion either which way. Maybe so. I don't agree with that. I think um, perhaps in the particular case, but in other cases like this, you wouldn't, particularly where the decision is a close wrong thing, which oftentimes these decisions are. 